But hey, welcome here. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Rick, and uh, I preach here on Sunday mornings. And today we get to talk about the resurrection. Uh, we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. That's what the church is meant to do. That's what we're here for. But the world does take a point in time to kind of block out a week and remember specifically his crucifixion and his resurrection, uh, labeled as the Holy Week. So welcome here, and uh, I hope that you will have a good experience if this is your first or second time here as our guest. Like I said, we are talking about the resurrection, and one of the things that pops into my mind whenever I study the resurrection is that the resurrection proved that God is a God of second chances, right? A lot of people in this room, you already know what it means to have a second chance, and it's, there are a few rare opportunities in life when we do get to have a second chance. Uh, Piper um, was my, my daughter. She's a, our little baby girl. She's two years old, and uh, she was wonderful, but unfortunately, Piper was kind of like the trial version, you know what I mean? And so we got a second chance with uh, our son Knox. He was just born. Uh, he'll be a month old already. It's, it's pretty crazy next, uh, this coming week. But, you know, you're a little bit more patient. You're a little bit more kind. All of the, uh, you know, the tears, the snot, the mess, the crying, the sleep exhaustion. You know, you're a little bit, you're a little bit more uh, responsible with it. I can remember when Piper was born. It completely wrecked my world. I was absolutely exhausted. And so this time around, you know, things are a little bit different. I kind of, if... if you, you know what I'm saying. I get a second chance. And I actually hear grandparents talk about this too. When they have grandchildren, um, I've heard a, a few people say it's almost like you get a second chance, right? Kind of do some of the things that you wish you would have done in the first place. But inevitably, right, we're human beings. And so uh, it just comes around full circle. And sometimes you forget that you got a second chance and you make mistakes. You ever made a mistake before? I've made a few mistakes in my lifetime, right? So it was the other night, I'm exhausted, uh, lots of tears, lots of crying, sleep deprivation, and I'm rocking back and forth, and I just want to go to sleep, and finally I just broke, right? I grew impatient, I told my wife, Angel, you're a full-grown woman, I'm not rocking you to bed anymore, you can put yourself to sleep. (laughs) Is she here? Yeah, she's here. Sorry, honey. That was a joke. That was a joke. I'm just kidding. Uh, She rocks me to sleep, and uh, that's the truth. But, but no, seriously, like with, with Knox, a lot more patient, a lot more gentle. But, you know, second chances. There's something about having a second chance that it makes you take advantage of the missed opportunity. Um, there are a few things, like I said, in life when you don't get a second chance. For instance, people pass away. And there are things that you say to them or there are things that you didn't say to them that you wish you could have said. And I know that there are, when I look into my history and my past, there are a few things that really stick with me that you wish, man, if I could just go back and do it over again, I would have done it completely differently. One of the things that sticks out in my mind was when my father had passed away, uh, when I was 14 years old, it it was 2002, and I had spent the entire summer with my grandfather. My grandfather, believe it or not, for those of you who know me, my grandfather was a construction worker, and he taught it for 30 years, but I couldn't hammer a nail to save my life. So this was grandpa's way of teaching me, right, if that makes sense. And uh, so I went and spent the summer at his house, and I didn't really communicate this with my dad. It was when I was going into my eighth grade year. And I had come home for the weekend after I had spent pretty much a month and a half away, and I had to get, you know, new clothes and just come home just, you know, for a quick touch base. I mean, my mom wanted to see me too. But on the way back down to Grandpa's house, it was oddly enough, my father was coming the other way to pick up my sister, and we were stopped at the stop sign, I'll never forget it. And he pulled around, and he slowed down, and he rolled down the window, and he yelled over at me, and he says, Rick, you're going to have to decide whether or not you want a father or a grandfather. And he drove away. And I can remember just feeling so angry and hurt, Uh, but I was sad because, you know, I didn't want my father to be upset with me. And then a few weeks later, he's gone. And I only got to spend one day with him in just a few months. And those types of things, they they just don't ever leave you. Those types of mistakes, they never leave you, even as, even as as a child, as his son. If I could go back, I would hug my dad. I would love him. I would spend time with him. I wouldn't put a summer job and learning construction work over my priority of having a relationship with him. If I could just go back in time and have a second chance, I would do everything differently. Well, the resurrection is about that we get a second chance with God. That everybody in this room has made mistakes. We've all messed up. We've all fallen short. I am a sinner. You are a sinner. But when Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins and resurrected from the dead, that was his message saying, here's a second chance. I want a relationship with you. And so the first thing that we're going to talk about is the power of a second chance. 
Some other words that you might high about a second chance, a retry, a do-over, a second shot, another chance. In a court of law, you can actually be prosecuted for a crime, and if they fail to uh, indict you or if they fail to criminalize you, you can actually have a retrial, right? If you're a computer person and you like computer programming, if you enter in a wrong command on a computer, you can have a, a retry, a second chance. You can go back in and enter the right command. And if you think about it like this, you know, we all have that opportunity that we can make our wrongs right, We can have a second chance. We can go back in like the computer programmers and we can re-enter God's commands into our own heart and into our own life and have a different outcome. You see, I not only wish that I could go back in time with my father and not do the wrong things that I did, but I also wish I could go back in time and begin to do right things. And so the resurrection is not just to beat you up and tell you that you're doing a bunch of things wrong and you need to stop that. The resurrection is about a message that you can begin to do things right. You can begin to have a relationship with God that is a right relationship with him. If I could explain it to you like this, it's like traveling uh, on a road and you're trying to reach your destination. And if you take the wrong direction, for instance, it really doesn't benefit you if all you do is you just change directions. No, in order to make progress, in order to go the right way, you have to get back on track. You have to begin to go into the right direction, not just a different direction. C.S. Lewis was one of the greatest Christian apologists that has ever lived, and he actually was an atheist, and after studying the evidence for the resurrection, uh, he became a Christian. Uh, He taught at Oxford University, one of the most intelligent men that we have uh, in Christianity, a completely incredible guy. You can go buy a bunch of his books online, but he's passed away now. He, He put it like this. He said, we all want progress, right? In other words, we all want to go in the right direction. But progress means getting nearer to the place where you want to be. And if you've taken a wrong turning, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back the soonest is the most progressive man. There is nothing progressive about being pig-headed and refusing to admit a mistake. And I think if you look at the present state of the world, it is pretty plain that humanity has made some big mistake. We're on the wrong road. And if that, uh, if that is so, we must go back. Going back is the quickest way on. And so this morning, as we talk about the resurrection, I have a question I want you to ask, and I want you to answer yourself. Which direction are you heading? Which way are you going? It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 50 years or five minutes. We're all in the category that we make mistakes. We've all gone the wrong direction. The real question is, which direction are you going? Not how much have you done for God? How many mistakes have you made? Which direction are you going? And so in order to take advantage of this second chance, the first thing that we have to do is we have to recognize mistakes have been made, <laughs> okay? Mistakes have definitely been made. When I, I like to look up church signs on Twitter. It's like once a week. They make fun of Christians. And, uh, and look, we deserve it, okay? If we put these kind of signs up there, we totally deserve to get made fun of. But I do have one grocery sign that I want to show you. Uh, here's the first one, right? Open nine days a week. Whoever painted that must have just graduated from the six best years of high school that he has ever had. You know what I mean? (laughs) Or she, okay? Don't want to be prejudiced. Uh, But here's here's some church signs. I I hope that we never do things like this, but it it happens, right? People do this. Um, We love hurting people. Good idea at first, (laughs) but probably a mistake, all right? Not really getting that message that you want to cross. Here's another one. Mistakes have been made. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> that is really good. Here's my last, uh, my, my favorite, right? And here's the last one. Do you know what hell is? Come here, our preacher. <laughs> I made the elders promise they would never put a sign like that up, right? But we all make mistakes, and if you go through the Bible, it is riddled. It is riddled with men who make mistakes, but that experience and feel the grace of God. And you know, sometimes, especially for those of us who have had a bad experience in church, and we label the church as just a bunch of hypocrites and people who judge us, and the truth is, we're, we're all hypocrites, all right? We all want to try to do what's right, but we make mistakes. And we would all be lying if we said we were uh, perfect, and that we had it all together. And so when you look at the biblical examples, when you come to this passion story about Jesus, these guys are riddled with mistakes. Some of the greatest leaders in the Christian 
Christian church have made some of the worst mistakes you could ever imagine. Let me give you an example. James, the brother of Jesus, right? Grew up with a guy. Had to wrestle with him, fight with him, whatever it was that James did. And James is actually a skeptic. He said that Jesus was out of his mind. Um, when he was uh, interacting with Jesus, he kind of like kept his distance, really wasn't a believer. I mean, James simply didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. In fact, John records that his brothers didn't believe in him, so he had more than one brother, right? And then Mark records uh, his brothers and sisters says, hey, this guy is out of his mind. And when Jesus was crucified on the cross, the only person that was there was Mary, his mother. Everyone else was gone. We don't know much about his father. But think about that for a minute. Think about if you're lying in the hospital and you are dying, wouldn't you want your family to be there? Wouldn't you want to be there for somebody in your life that was dying, especially by crucifixion? I mean, it was the worst way you could possibly die. You died from suffocation, not from blood loss. But here is Jesus, and the only person that is there is Mary and his faithful follower, John. And so James, the skeptic, doubted Jesus' divinity, made a huge mistake. Have you ever doubted before? Have you ever questioned the existence of God? I certainly have. We make mistakes. We mess up. But look at the evidence for the resurrection. Look at the reasons why Christianity is true. Second of all, all the disciples. When Jesus was arrested, right, before his crucifixion, the Bible says that all of his disciples fled. They ran. In fact, one details, one guy was grabbed, and they ripped his clothes from him, and he ran away naked, right? I mean, imagine that scenario for a second. You are so scared. You are so fearful. You have just broken off complete loyalty to Jesus that you are willing to run away, clothes or no clothes. And that's exactly what one of his followers did. Mistakes. People make them. How about Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, right? Saul admitted, I persecuted the church. He was on a mission to end the Christian religion. He arrested people, threw them in prison. He oversaw Christians' deaths. When Paul, after he became a Christian, he was renamed Paul uh, instead of Saul, he actually stood before his Jewish brothers and sisters. It was before this council because he had been arrested. And look what he had to say. He admitted, he said, I persecuted the followers of the way to their death. I arrested both men and women, throwing them into prison. And as the high priest and all the council called themselves to testify, I even obtained letters from them and their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul says, look, I've made mistakes. In fact, Paul was so guilt-ridden from these mistakes that that he read that he actually included it in many of his letters and in much of his testimony. I am the least of the apostles. I don't deserve God's grace, but he has given it to me, and it is a gift. But man, have I made my fair share of mistakes. And then last, but certainly not least, probably one of my favorite characters in the gospel was Peter. Peter, at first, was the man, right? I mean, he is the guy who stands up to speak up for Jesus all the time, and sometimes a little bit too much. When he first interacted with Jesus, and Jesus performed his first miracle, the Bible says that he fell down on his knees, and he said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a wicked man. He immediately felt that conviction. All of those mistakes started coming up in his mind, all of those failures, and maybe that's something that happens to you whenever you enter church, or whenever you pick up your Bible. Maybe your mind is just clouded with the mistakes that you've made, and you're like, look, I I just can't go. I can only stand it maybe once a year on Easter, maybe Christmas if I'm feeling good, but man, I just just don't want to feel guilty all the time, right? Do you want to feel guilty all the time? Absolutely not. I don't want to feel guilty all the time. But here is Peter, just rushed with guilt when he came and interacted with Jesus. But in that moment, the Bible says, Jesus reached out to him and he says, Peter, don't be afraid. He gives him a gift of grace. Do not be afraid. You are going to catch men, not just fish. He was uneducated, He was from the lowest of the lowest community, uh, didn't really know how to read and write. And so when we have the epistles of Peter, he actually had to have a transcriber write for him as he dictated the words. And, And so by society standards, this was a guy who at the very least, at the very least, would have been absolutely ruled out to be a follower of the Messiah, the king the one that was going to come and change the entire world. I mean, somebody like this had made too many mistakes, had not even learned nearly enough. He didn't deserve his position, but yet Jesus extended grace to him. 
He was named one of the 12 apostles. Many of us know that. I mean, what an awesome position. He was the guy who got out of the boat in the midst of a storm. These waves, 10 foot high waves, they were certainly going to die. He sees Jesus out there standing on the water, performing a miracle, and he calls out to Peter, and Peter steps out of the boat. I mean, that's the kind of guy that Peter was. Absolutely fearless. He was bold enough to speak up to Jesus when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter rightly said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. A powerful statement. In fact, John records this. When when Peter was talking with Jesus, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I mean, an utter, complete confession of loyalty, of faithfulness. There was not too many people like the Apostle Peter. He was one of the three that stood on the mountain of Jesus' transfiguration. Jesus didn't invite all 12 of his disciples, only three, Peter, James, and John. And there was Peter. So he's high up in rank, right? According to Jesus, he's on the inner circle. In fact, before Jesus' crucifixion, when he tells them, I'm going to have to die, Peter said, may it not be so. And as a confession of his complete loyalty, Peter said this, even if I have to die for you, even if I have to die with you, I will never, ever disown you. These are pretty powerful words. When it came time to arrest Jesus before his crucifixion in John chapter 18, the soldiers came, they went to seize Jesus, and Peter was the guy who stood up to fight. He took a sword, he struck the side of a servant's head, one one um, one of the officers, cut off his ear, and Jesus told him to stop. We're not gonna fight like that, is what Jesus told him, and so he stopped. Peter was somebody that was fearless and faithful, but at the end of the day, he wasn't perfect. He made his fair share of mistakes. In fact, Peter probably made one of the greatest mistakes that we find in the Bible is that he denied Jesus three times. And Jesus told him, Jesus told him, you're going to deny me. And you can just think about Peter in that moment, right? No way. After what I've seen, after what I've heard, after what I've experienced, there is no way I would turn back and make another mistake. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt something so gut-wrenchingly horrible that you promised yourself you would never do it again, right? But what happens? Human nature gets the best of you. Here you find yourself making the same mistake over and over again because you just can't break out of that cycle. And here is Peter, so bold, so proud, and yet in this moment of weakness, he's standing in the courtyard. Jesus has just been arrested, and he denies Jesus three times. And he doesn't just deny Jesus. But he calls down curses upon him. Look at what Matthew records up on the screen. It says, Then he began to call down curses and swore to them, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. He made such a terrible mistake that he wept bitterly. And I have cried some tears over the mistakes that I've made. When my father passed away, I wept for weeks. And some things like that, they just never leave you. How I was impatient with Piper, there are some things that just, my daughter Piper, that just never leave you. They stick with you, mistakes that you wish you could just do over again. You could make right. And so despite the mistakes that have been made, these men, as well as us in this room, have the opportunity for a second chance with God. And that is promised by the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection promises us a second chance. A lot of us in here who have heard the Easter story, we know the conclusion. But sometimes we forget the mess of the details in between Jesus' ministry and his crucifixion and his resurrection. And here's a question you can ask yourself. What possibly happened to James the brother of Jesus, that caused him to turn from not just a skeptic to a believer, but from a skeptic to a believer to one of the greatest leaders that the church has ever known. Some church tradition says he was taken up to the top of the temple and he was pushed off, didn't die, and so they clubbed him to death. Other people uh, record in church history, uh, such as Josephus, a Jewish historian, that he was stoned to death. What happened to James where he said, this guy is crazy, this guy is mad, he's my brother after all, I know him. I'm in a position to know whether or not Jesus is the Messiah or not. And yet, after his skepticism, he becomes a believer. What happened to James that caused him to change? What caused the disciples, for instance? All 12 of them. The Bible says they all fled. Like I said, one ran away naked. What caused all 12 of them at once 
to go from afraid and running and hiding to boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus. I mean, think about it. Their Jewish leader was dead. He was gone. And he wasn't just dead. He was shamefully executed like a criminal hanging naked on a cross for hours. Nails through his wrists and through his feet. He had been beaten to where the Bible says it's by, your stri- it's by his stripe that you have been healed. It only caused the stripes of Jesus in the singular because he had been beaten so much that you couldn't tell where one ended and one began. If you could imagine hamburger meat, that's basically what the body of Jesus was like on the cross. And so what happened to these disciples that caused them to do an about face? Their Jewish leader was dead. For if you were a Jew, nobody resurrected until the end of the world, the final resurrection. What happened to these guys to where they changed? They overcame their doctrinal beliefs. In fact, the book of Acts chapter 17, the other Jews who decided not to become Christians, they looked at these followers of Jesus and they said, who are these guys who are turning the world upside down? They're causing a lot of trouble for us. They absolutely refuse to deny that Jesus is the Christ and that he resurrected from the dead. What happened to these guys to make that change? Consider Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee, rich and wealthy, prominent, has a lot of prestige, persecuting the church. I mean, if there was anyone who had something to lose, it was the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. What happened to this guy that caused him not only to overcome his doctrinal beliefs, but overcome his persecution of the church, repent of his sin, and do a 180 turn in the opposite direction and started to become a Christian? was baptized in Jesus' name, gave his life to Jesus. What happened to this guy named Paul? Paul said in Galatians 1.23, when he talked about how he converted to Christianity, this is his reputation in the church. He said, they only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. What happened to Paul that caused him to change, to overcome his mistakes? Think about Peter. The amount of shame and the guilt. I mean, you talked a really good game, but at the end of the day, you ended up denying Jesus three times. And I think if any of us were to be in that situation, we all probably would have done the same thing. We like to think that we wouldn't, but when persecution is knocking at the front door, we all do things and make mistakes we wish we wouldn't have. What happened to Peter that caused him to overcome his shame and his cursing and his denial of Jesus And so he stands before his critics and he says, this Jesus whom you have crucified, he is both Lord and he's Christ. In other words, I don't care what you do to me. I'm going to boldly proclaim Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and he is resurrected from the dead. There's one unique situation in Acts chapter 4 where Peter, after he had some type of experience, right? He went from running from God to running to God. He stood before his own Jewish people, before councils. They were going to sentence this guy to death. But he was going around and preaching the word. There was one guy who was lame, and he walked up and he healed the guy. And so they called this guy in before the court and the council, and they called in Peter and John. They said, you need to give an account for this. By what power are you healing this, these people, right? Is it by some demon, some devil? Because we're going we're to kill you if it is. And you can read it. It's in, like I said, it's in Acts chapter 4. And so he stood before them, and he says, I want you all to know, and all of the people of Israel, that the God who I serve... The one whom you crucified on the cross, it is by his name that I perform these mighty deeds and these wonders. And you guys crucified him. I mean, you could just imagine the amount of courage it would take to face your death. What changed before the garden now to the court? It was Jesus' resurrection. And so he stood before them and he says, there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. Boldly proclaims the name of Jesus, even in the face of death. And so the same man who was a coward in the courtyard is now a champion before the councils. And the question is why? What caused Peter to have a second chance? And we all know the answer this morning, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is so powerfully true. And so thus, even skeptical German New Testament scholar, Gard Ludemann, concludes this. It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as risen, as the risen Christ. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, he is a very, uh, one of the most popular scholars in the entire uh, known world at the time. He says, this is why as a historian, not as a Christian, 
not as a believer, but as a historian, a professional historian, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. If there was anyone who had the position to determine whether or not Jesus really resurrected from the dead, it was the disciples who later became the apostles. These guys saw him crucified. He was sealed with a tomb, a 2,000-pound stone. There was a four-point guard uh, that were Romans over, over the tomb. And yet they go to the tomb, and it's found empty. Jesus is alive. And so we have the promise of the resurrection. Jesus experienced this incredible moment where his body was raised back to life by his power. And remember, Jesus is God in the flesh, and so his power is not necessarily seen. These divine properties, these attributes, aren't something physical that you can see. And Jesus proved that we all get a second chance by raising his body from the dead. And you know what happened? Mary Magdalene, she was overcome with grief. She couldn't believe her Messiah was dead. The disciples were in hiding. And so she goes to his tomb and she walks up and she sees the stone rolled away and it's empty. And she begins to have kind of like a panic attack. Where is he? And she sees this gardener and she runs up to him and she says, where is he? Where is Jesus? What, what happened to his body? And it was Jesus. And she fell down and she worshiped him and she clung to him. And he says, don't cling to me. You got to go back and you have to tell others. Which, by the way, is another proof text that New Testament Christianity is true. Under Old Testament Judaism, women, and this is terrible, horrible prejudice. This is why Jesus is so awesome. Women were considered less than dogs. That's, that's, that's basically how they viewed women. Women were not even allowed to testify in court right? You weren't allowed to testify in court if you were a woman. And here it is a woman who discovers the empty tomb of Jesus, and she is the first one to share this message. And so she goes back to the disciples, and she says, Jesus is alive. He is is arisen from the dead. And guess who gets up and not just goes towards the tomb, but takes off running? It is Peter. That's what the Bible says. It is Peter. He goes off, and he runs towards the tomb. Why? He's overwhelmed with guilt. Is it possible that what he said about his resurrection is true? Is it possible that God would be willing to give me a second chance? And the answer is yes. You see, even in the midst of this miracle, Peter, he had a trouble with Jesus that he carried along with him, a certain guilt, a certain doubt that really the other followers didn't know. But because we have the Bible, we know what that doubt was. I deny Jesus. Is there any grace for me? You think about Saul of Tarsus. I killed Christians. Is there enough grace for me? The disciples, I ran away from him when he needed me the most. Is there any grace for me? James, I doubted Jesus. And I saw everything, and yet my heart was so hard that I doubted him. Is there grace enough for me? And the resurrection answers so very loudly this morning. Absolutely yes. There is grace enough not only for them, but for you and me. And it is only by God's grace that we have been saved. And we find Peter's moment of redemption in John chapter 21. Jesus had resurrected from the dead. He had been proclaimed, I am alive. And he was getting ready to prepare his followers, being Peter, one of them, to go out and boldly proclaim this message. But Jesus had a score to settle with Peter. And so he approaches Peter in his resurrected body, and he had shared a meal with him. And it says in John chapter 21, verses 15 and 17, it says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these other apostles, these other, these other disciples? And look at Peter's response. Yes, Lord. Despite the mistakes that I've made, Jesus, I love you. He says, you know that I love you, Jesus said, so feed my lambs. Take care of my people. And it happens again, verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Take care of my people. And for the third time, right, parents, when you have to tell your kids twice, you get it, right? The third time, teenagers, when your parents ask you the same question over and over again, you're like, I've had enough of this. <laughs> I've only told you already, right? And here is Peter, and he's not exasperated. He's ashamed. He's broken. He's sad because he knew what he did. And so he's asked for the third time, Peter, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, 
feed my sheep. Here's what the resurrection proved, that love triumphs over our mistakes. Thank you.